The General Epistle of James Chapter 1 James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted, when he is drawn away, of his own lust, and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Chapter 2 My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him. Nahum, chapter 1 The Burden of Nineveh, the Book of the Vision of Nahum the Elkishite God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. 
The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, Though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Chapter 2 He that dasheth in pieces has come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong.
Now this jewelry I'm going to show you, except the second two pieces, could not be bought in a store until a few years ago. You stop and think about it when you started seeing this stuff. To buy these symbols here, you had to go to a, a, an occult store. Of course, that was easy for San Francisco. They've always been a little weird. But you'd go to the occult stores, but you had to prove that you were initiated witch of a coven before they would sell this stuff to you, and it was made by their coven silversmith. The first one's called a pentacle. If you put a circle around it, it's called the pentagram. It's a symbol of witchcraft. At one point up, it's a symbol of witchcraft. Two points up, like it's showing kind of there, it's the symbol of Satanist church. The symbol of the horn god. You might also notice it's also the symbol of the eastern star. We were in San Francisco last night, and in the building that the Illuminati houses there, the Rothschild's private enforcer, Isaac Bonowitz, he's like a living computer, he's also one of the members of the council that I left, in the store down below, which sells many pieces of occult jewelry, they sell ladies' compacts with eastern stars embedded in them, with all the little runes and so on. This is called the hexagram, not the Star of David. The Star of David is a name change on it. David was dead and buried when that star was created by a son that had backslid and went into demonic worship. Solomon would seal his documents of war and his occult documents with that thing. They call it the Crest of Solomon or the Hexagram. And that's where the word to hex or to cast an evil spell came from. Witches, when they conjure demons, they call the demons up to talk to them in person, this star must be drawn on the floor for the demon to arrive in or it won't appear. Now that gives you an idea. It's the most evil sign in the occult world. This symbol in various forms means that you're an initiated witch of witchcraft. And if you watch television, well, I'm sure you do. If you watch television, you'll notice that many of the television stars are now wearing this symbol openly. Why not? Christians don't know what it means. You also notice it was a sign of the Shriners, too. This one up above is being sold. Oh, well, this one. Oh, well. Somehow, there we go. Let me get out. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work. There we go. Hey, we got it worked out. The first one's called the Ankh. They call it the Cross of Life now. It's done in Christian bookstores and so on. The Cross of Life or the Ankh comes from Egypt. It means that you're a worshiper of Ra, the sun god. That's the Egyptian name for Lucifer. So it means that you worship Lucifer. It means that you despise virginity, that you're against virginity, that you practice orgies, and that you believe in reincarnation. That means that you don't believe in heaven or hell, that when you die you're going to come back again, and the word of God is a lie because it says you'll live once and then judgment. But they say no. The next is the broken cross, the peace sign. It didn't originate in Frisco or London during the peace movement. It's been around a long time. We've heard a lot of cracks about it, you know, the footprint of American chicken and all this type of thing. This is what it is. When a member wants to be, when a person wants to become a member of witchcraft, and they come from a Christian background, there I didn't have to take this initiation because I was born into witchcraft. They're given a cross made out of ceramic clay, you know, baked clay, and it's turned upside down, and they take the crossbars and they break, it, forcing the crossbars down and break the crossbars off, and they throw the pieces to the floor and shatter it. And the priest or priestess, whoever's doing the initiation, then announces, "You are free from the bondage of the Christian Church." And because of this act, you shall have peace evermore. Thus, the peace sign. It's called the broken cross. This one you're not going to find until about a year from now. Anybody ever seen this symbol before? Everybody wants to... <laughs> you're right. 666. It's three overlapping sixes. Okay, here's where you can find it. You can find it on the world currency printed out of Brussels. We bought $10 billion of it, but our president decided that it's better to go with the credit card than the currency now, so we're not going to use it. You'll find it in clothing and shoes made in the common market countries, in the labels of the clothing. More recent, about a year ago, it was on national television, when the president of the United States, you know, the peanut eater from Georgia, well, I mean, you know, I'm, that's about the best I can do for him. I could say more. Said he had personally designed a national security card that would be the answer to the problems in the United States. And that every citizen, law-abiding citizen, would have one of these cards to prove they were a law-abiding citizen. You know, whatever. 
Then, he got done making a speech, he left, his press secretary came up and says to the newsman, here's a picture. Now, for some reason, with all the flashballs popping and stuff, that card, this picture, never got printed in the paper. I don't know why. Maybe they decided it was a bad move. But in the center of the card was a pearl white glossy card, computer plastic type. In the center, in kind of a gray, with words written over it, you know, but in the background, you know, like a watermark, was this envelope. Welcome to the last generation. They're putting their forces together. Now, if you've been going to the grocery stores and the department stores, you've been noticing the new computer cash registers. The, you know, one shopping step type cash registers, and you put your card in it, ring up the purchase, and it does all the business for you right then and there. Well, all the stores are supposed to switch over to them, and the little poor stores are supposed to get the little phone unit that hooks into your phone, and you zip the card through. This is all supposed to happen in the next year, right on time schedule, just like it should be. Then, things will be a little different around here, because by then they plan on destroying the money that you have. And then you'll have to use the card, because the money will be worthless. Now, if you think, you've, if you've been noticing all the television commercials, Security is the word that everybody's been using on television commercials. Prepare for the future. Pack up for security this and security that. And then they're going to turn around and they're going to wipe your security off the face of the man. I'm going to destroy that microphone before it's over. Now, if I'm stepping on your little safe world, I'm sorry. I'm trying to tell you something in advance. And I'm going to give you a reading list so you don't think I'm the only nut in the world. The first book is None Dare Call Conspiracy. I'm going to give these quick and then I'll take a few questions. We've got a few minutes and that's it. The next is the Rockefeller Files. And the last one is Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. Now, those can be found in most bookstores. They're by Gary Allen. But I recommend one that you find in the Christian bookstore. It's called The Day the Dollar Dies. You might decide to invest the financial money that you're saving in your savings account that will be worthless before this year is out in the work of God. I'm serious. It will be worthless before this year is out. This time next year, the time schedule they have, I'll give you a few events. I'm not prophesying, I'm giving you physical knowledge. You may think I'm crazy. They thought I was crazy back in 1972 when I said we were going to have a fuel shortage. They thought I was crazy back in 1973 when I said watch for the coal mines to close. So you may think I'm crazy, but next year when it's all happening, at least I told you in advance. You got a little bit of warning. There'll be 10 million people out of work this time next year. Now that's when our welfare system, unemployment system, and social security system goes collapse because it won't be able to handle that many people out of work. And you may want to go home and pray and ask yourself what this country is going to be like with 10 million people not eating and not having any money. And then you may want to pray that a lot of souls get one and Jesus comes quickly. I know I'm going to. Okay, I'll take some questions and answers. Occultists around the world believe that once a symbol is created, it acquires power of its own, and that the more secret it is, the more power it has. They believe the greatest power of all is created in the symbol if the uninitiated never discovers that it even exists. This reminds us of the Jonathan Livingston Siegel phenomenon that I mentioned previously, where demons seem to assign themselves to positions created by men to be worshipped. So someone can create a symbol with the wicked intention that it should represent something diabolical and then because of their motives in creating it, the symbol indeed takes on that power which has been imbued into it. It's nothing less than witchcraft. But if secrecy gives strength to the power of the symbols, they need to give them double meanings to help with the concealment. Albert Pike, a 19th century 33 degree mason, wrote an authoritative and infamous book revealing the secrets of the craft called Morals and Dogma. In it he writes, Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. The adepts, sages or elect refers to those of the 33rd degree or above, the so-called illuminated ones. Morals and dogma was never intended for the eyes of the lower masons or the profane non-masons. The title page of the book asks that anyone in possession of a copy should return it to the lodge upon his withdrawal or death so that it would never reach a mass audience. 
Copies have, however, crept out of the lodges and its contents are available for public consumption. Albert Pike says of the symbols within Freemasonry, Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. He then goes on to say, There must always be a commonplace interpretation for the mass of initiates, of the symbols that are eloquent to the adepts. Here Pike clearly outlines that every occult symbol Freemasons use should have a false public meaning in order to keep the true darker meaning hidden. When non-Masons or even lower level Freemasons ask about doctrines or rituals, they will be misdirected with the false interpretation so as to keep them from the diabolical truth. It is only as they advance and prove themselves at the lower levels that the truth is gradually revealed to them. Like we have consistently seen, this system of double meanings is the very definition of the occult. Dark ideas and meanings concealed in full view through allegory and symbolism. With this in mind, take a look at this picture from the Grand Lodge of North Carolina. You should now be quite adept at interpreting these symbols. There's the sun representing Baal. There's the moon representing Asherah, an all-seeing eye above everything representing Lucifer. The rays coming from the eye signify that Lucifer claims to be the giver of enlightening knowledge. 33-degree Mason Manley P. Hall explains of the all-seeing eye. The all-seeing eye symbolizes God, who is obeyed by the heavens, manifested in the heart, and will reward the righteous. This symbol is famously represented on the US $1 bill and is depicted by an eye in the pyramid. The pyramid is incorporated in the symbol because God is the great architect. Now we know that the eye doesn't represent God at all but represents Lucifer and so that's a misdirection. You will also notice that the sun and moon are above columns. This is a new one but columns in Freemasonry represent gods. Therefore, this image in its entirety, which is replicated frequently in the craft, shows a sun god, a moon goddess, and above and behind them all is Lucifer. Columns are also phallic symbols. Albert Mackey, 33 degree Freemason, writes, The phallus was an imitation of the male generative organ. It was represented usually by a column, was surrounded by a circle at the base. The circle at the base represents the female vulva and therefore inserting the upright column into the circle makes it a sexual symbol and that brings us back to this symbol we looked at earlier. An article in a Masonic bulletin says, The female principle, symbolized by the moon, assumed the form of a lunette or crescent, while the male principle, symbolized by the sun, assumed the form of the lingam and placed himself erect in the centre of the lunette, like the mast of a ship. Remember the mast and ship symbol from Catholicism. There are so many ways to express this exact same idea. We saw earlier that the obelisk outside the Vatican made this point and circle symbol from the air, but you will find these obelisks or Asherah poles literally all over the world. The most imposing and important ones are to be found in the major cities or power bases and financial capitals, but wherever you live, you will probably not have to go far to find one close to you. This obelisk is from London, and this one is from Paris, and this one is from New York. And these were all taken directly from Egypt and rebuilt in their new locations in the 19th century. The London and New York obelisks are a pair, while the twin of the Paris obelisk is still in Egypt. You'll find them on every continent, in democracies and autocracies, in nations of all political persuasions, you'll find them in major capitals and financial centres and probably near seats of government and power, but also in the farthest flung and most remote areas of a country. You'll find them in your local parks, in your local graveyards. They are all pervasive around the world and are nothing but sexual symbols representing the satanic sun god, Baal. During the summer of 2009, while still researching the series, I visited the Wallace Monument in Stirling, Scotland, and suspected just from its design that a Freemason may have been involved. These suspicions were quickly confirmed. It was in fact designed by a Freemason. Now obviously it could be argued that most towering buildings today are column shaped, so a level of common sense must be employed. Not every skyscraper was designed to be a hidden symbol. 
However, you will find that wherever Freemasons have been involved, sexual connotations are no accident. You will also see obelisks very frequently in graveyards. Often they are for deceased Freemasons, but again, this is not always the case. It appears to have just become the fashion for some, and many may have picked them without realising their origin. Remember the recurring mountain theme from earlier also. Satan likes to claim the high points in his bid to become the most high. With that knowledge, I looked for the high points in Scotland's capital city, Edinburgh, to see if there was an obelisk present. Sure enough, on Carlton Hill, there is a significant one that gives views over the whole city. Notably, it is within easy view of the Scottish Parliament, the castle and other traditional strongholds of power. As the King of Tyre wants to control the Prince of Tyre, the human governors and rulers, you will often find this symbolism within range of governmental buildings or financial centres. There is also a theory that these monuments are built along ley lines, ley lines being geometric lines that run along landscapes, connecting ancient or secret features together. The idea is that they are channels along which energy can flow between points. It might be an interesting experiment if you were to find the high points within your own area and check for obelisks. If there are no obelisks, you may instead find stone circles or other deliberately designed shapes. Alternatively, look for the seats of power, influence and financial centres, then check for any obelisks or occult symbols that are overlooking those buildings. Perhaps survey the geometry, degrees and angles at which the obelisk stands to those buildings. You may see physical evidence of satanic influence over government leaders in this way. I know for sure that the local high point in my town often has a stone circle made out of rocks, and if you move them and go back later, they'll have been rearranged back into a stone circle again. Have a look and see what you find. This is perhaps the most well-known Masonic symbol, the square and compass. Low-level Masons are told that the G stands for God or geometry, which the great architect used to design the universe. But the real hidden meaning is that it's representative of the sex act, as usual. The letter G stands for generation or generative power. Albert Pike writes in Morals and Dogma that sexual union could be represented by the letter G, the generative principle. This term, generative principle, is code for the sex act. Pike goes on to explain that the compass, therefore, is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity and the square of the productive earth or universe. Therefore, the Masons look at the compass as a male element and the square as the female element, which interact to produce the G in the middle. The square and compass is also an adaptation of the most wicked symbol of all, the hexagram. Historian John J. Robinson reveals in his book, Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry, that the Mason's compass is nothing more than the satanic hexagram with some key pieces removed. As Robinson points out, the Mason began with a fully formed hexagram and then simply removed the horizontal bar from each interlocking triangle. The upper triangle was then stylized into a compass, while the bottom triangle was made into a square. Finally, he placed a G in the middle to represent the generative force of the male and female together. In this next example, we see they put a sun god in the middle instead of the G. The full hexagram is also used in Freemasonry. Masonic author Albert Mackey tells of the sexual connotation of this hexagram. The triangle pointing downward is a female symbol corresponding to the yoni, and the upward pointing triangle is the male, the lingam. When the two triangles are interlaced, it represents the union of the active and passive forces in nature. It represents the male and female elements. The upward pointing male triangle is represented by light, and the downward facing female triangle is dark. They interlock again with a sexual connotation. These symbols have many layers, and nothing is there without great thought and attention. The hexagram also represents the number of the beast, which is 666, because it has six points, six sides, and six angles. Notice also the T, or Tau, within this particular hexagram. T represents Tamuts, the product of the union between the Sun God and Moon Goddess. The little circle on top of the T also turns this symbol into an Ankh cross. 
that Ankhna cultism is representative of the life-giving power of the sun. It's also worth highlighting that this male and female, light and dark duality concept has survived in the eastern forms of the Babylonian religion, such as Buddhism. For example, we are probably very familiar with the yin and yang symbol here. In this symbol, the light side of course represents the male aspect and the dark side represents the female aspect. This again is a sexual symbol and it's very commonly used in the world today. This black and white motif is represented another way in Freemasonry through checked floors. This is a suitable way of hiding its true meaning from the profane. Albert Pike said the black and white pavement symbolizes the good and evil principles of the Egyptian and Persian creed. It is the warfare of Michael and Satan, light and shadow, which is darkness, day and night, freedom and despotism. The all-seeing eye, or Lucifer, is behind both Baal and Asherah, which means he's behind both the light and the dark. Good and evil, or light and dark, coming from the same source, is a satanic concept. This next photo is a great example of the double meaning of symbols. Look at the floor and you'll see the black and white checks, but you'll also notice a pentagram. An upright pentagram denotes man, Adam and Eve, and this is considered to be the light side. Turn the pentagram upside down, however, and it represents the dark horned goat of Satan, Baphomet. Now look at the photo again. From our viewpoint on this side of the camera, we see the pentagram as upright, which denotes a light organization working for the good of man. And this is how Freemasons portray themselves in public. They like to point out the good they do in the community. From the perspective of the Masons on the other side of the camera, however, and from their side of the floor, they see something quite different in that symbol. From their side, looking towards us, the pentagram is inverted, which is depicting Baphomet and the real dark agenda of the organization. What they see is different to what they present to us to see. Occultists of all types will frequently be seen to be very generous in public. They will become involved with charities, donate freely with their time and money, and generally perform acts that will endear themselves to the public. For example, it was widely reported in recent years that Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling was the most generous giver to charity in the whole of Scotland. This invites statements such as, well, if she gives so much to charity, she can't possibly be a bad person. Harry Potter can't be anything to worry about. We have to remember it is always in their best interests to present a light side to the public which draws empathy and trust, but which masks a dark hidden agenda. Freemasons also wear an apron within their lodges, and again we should now easily be able to make sense of the imagery contained on it. But the aprons are in fact double-sided, like this. The light front side is seen openly, but then contrast it with a hidden dark side that is concealed from view, one thing on the surface, another thing in reality. This quote from Masonic author Carl Cloudy sums it all up. Cut through the outer shell and find a meaning. Cut through that meaning and find another. Under it, if you dig deep enough, you may find a third, a fourth. Who shall say how many teachings? In his typically deceptive way, Satan hides meanings within meanings within meanings, so that darkness becomes light and light darkness. His intention is always to lead people away from the truth and towards their destruction. He is a master of deception. Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma cuts to the chase when he exclaims, This idea of seeking the light is an interesting one because it sounds vaguely Christian on the surface. 
When Masons talk about moving towards the light, however, they're talking about moving towards the so-called illuminating knowledge of Lucifer, which is in fact darkness. You may hear politicians using this light motif from time to time. Alice A. Bailey, one of the most prominent occultists of the 20th century, wrote in her book, The Externalization of the Hierarchy. The Masonic fraternity is the home of the mysteries and the seat of the initiation. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized and is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. She then goes on to say, Every Masonic lodge is a temple of religion and its teaching instruction in religion. Masonry is the successor to the mysteries. It can't be made any clearer than that. Alice Bailey, incidentally, was one of the most influential New Agers of the 20th century. Indeed, she invented the term New Age and wrote over 25 books by channeling from a demonic spirit guide. We'll find out more about her later in the United Nations section, but for now we only need to know that she knows what she's talking about when she talks about occult themes. She then goes on to say, there is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarising the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. These mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the Church and the Masonic fraternity. When the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as a consequence of the first initiation. Henry R. Evans writes, into Freemasonry have been poured the irradiations of the mystical schools of antiquity. Particularly is this so in the higher degrees of the order, such as the Scottish Rite, where undeniable traces of Kabbalism, Neoplatonism, Rosicrucianism and other mystical cults are plainly discernible. I do personally contend that Freemasonry is the direct descendant of the mysteries, but that our ritual makers of the higher degrees have copied the ancient ceremonies of initiation so far as the knowledge of those ceremonies exists. Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, said, Masonic orders have contained the most influential men in many governments, and virtually every occult order has many Masonic roots. Now finally watch this clip of a Freemason admitting on camera that he believes Lucifer is the source of light and that he is helping mankind. In particular, note his confusion. Lucifer, what is your problem? Just that, sir. Okay. I'm a Christian, sir. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything about, about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Lu mm -hmm. Say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, see the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. No. And you're, hey, what you're about confirming those hospitals? It. They, they, they you know what, sir? <clears throat> Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not, we did not do these good deeds in your name. And you'll say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus said it? In Matthew chapter 5. Mercy. No. That's hard to believe. So, you're a Christian and you don't know that. Actually... No, I really am. You are. Because exactly. I'm pure and virtuous. You're pure and virtuous, okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're perfect without Jesus, right? No, 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 no. Okay, tell me about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Oh. Well, he's, he's my leader. Is he the Son of God? Yes, he is. Is he the only worshipful master? Yes. Have you ever been called Worshipful Master? No, because I, I've just been too busy. I've been working. Working. Been working to help people. What like kind you. of work? Okay. Get out of here. <clears throat> See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light. You heard it?